G'day, this is where the Murray River meets the Hume Weir about 20 clicks out of Albury on the New South Wales Victorian border. I'm here for one reason and one reason only. This is Croc Country. Well, it isn't really crocodile country, but they reckon a croc that answers to the name of Reg has escaped from a nearby wildlife park. And they reckon it might be a job for me, Rusty Gudgeon. So I'm gonna hop in the chopper and take a look. My hunt begins way up in the upper reaches of one of the world's great rivers the mighty Murray. No two rivers are ever the same. For instance, our Murray and the Nile in Egypt. The differences are plain. No pyramids, pharaohs, camels or date palms along the Murray. But there are a couple of striking similarities. Millions of trillions of years ago, these inland waterways were channels full of a liquidy substance known as water. The dinosaurs called them rivers. Much later, native peoples fished and used the bark from trees on the bank to make canoes. They managed this without upsetting nature too much. However, the Industrial Revolution ushered in a whole new era. One of dams, hydroelectricity, cars, trains, planes, Introduce plants and animals, mechanical monsters, Roll. scary guys. Ah, scare, take that. Why, why I order? <laughs> what the? <laughs> hey, hey, settle. <coughs> yeah, sorry. River life was changing rapidly. When you put a dam on a river, you change the flow of the river. Oh, duh, I hear you say. But by changing the flow, you change what's underneath the river and what's around it. You see, in the old days, flooding provided the necessary water for trees like river red gums to help them get going and growing. The length of time between floods helped to determine the mix of plants on the floodplain that stretched out from the river. When you decrease the number of floods, it decreases the diversity of plants on the floodplain and this can allow exotic species to invade. The same goes for wetlands and billabongs. They have their own unique plants and animals, many of which you wouldn't see in the main river channel. High river flows are vitally important to many freshwater fish. Floods stimulate many fish to migrate upstream and reproduce. Golden perch, for example, can migrate over a thousand kilometres. There's heaps of food on the floodplain and that's good for the littlies in their first few months of life so they can kick on. Some native fish breed only in flood years. The river is like a gigantic flow of food, but instead of carrying bananas and stuff, it carries organic matter like leaf litter, which is so vital to the food chain. Okay, so it goes like this. Now these little critters here are carbon dioxide molecules. They're converted into organic material by plants and, uh, and, um, algae. and algae that live in the rivers and streams uh, in the surrounding catchment. What's a catchment? What's a catchment, I hear you ask? A catchment is uh, all the mountains and the valleys and the properties and the farmlets and uh, and the uh, streams and the... Um, and the people. And the people who uh, live and exist in all the surrounding area of the uh, river. Uh, all the things that exist around the river, that is a catchment 
of the river. Now, once this food is uh, is uh, organic mat matter is in the, uh, in the in the river, uh, animals and bacteria and fungi come and feed on it. Now, the source of that organic material and the timing of its delivery into the river system and how long it actually stays in that section of the river is entirely dependent on the flow of the river. Well, at the same time as the river is being starved with organic material from the floodplain, the levels of nitrogen and phosphorus are increasing due to changed land practices. Nitrogen and phosphorus come from fertilizers, chemicals, even a cow pooing in the river. Increased amounts of these nutrients combined with low river flow have fueled the growth of blue-green algae in the river. Can you imagine having to drink that? Well, I'm gonna, because I'm tough. I don't recommend you do it, though. <laughs> Here goes, down the hatch. Turn the camera off, Justin. Drink it. Justin, turn the camera off. Drink it, it'll look good. <laughs> Here we go. Justin, turn the camera off. No, drink it. I'm warning you. And here's one to think about. If you change the food source in the river, it's likely to change the species of animal that feeds on it. Okay, you'll notice with all our demonstrations and stuff, we never use the environment itself. We're always using models, because if you don't care about the environment, you don't care about anything. It's like these pigs here. Look at that. Someone's just drunk that can of beer and then chucked it on the ground. Makes me sick to the stomach. How are you going to pick that up? No, you pick it up, mate. No, no, pick it up. Can't leave it there. No, well, yeah, well, we won't, we won't leave it there. We'll, we'll pick it up. You pick it up. No, just pick it up now. Mate, pick it up. Justin, come on. Pick it up, mate. I want, hey, you, I want to see you pick mate, it up. Mate, you, you, you pick it up, all right? You Turn the camera off. Turn the camera no, off. Pick, I want to see you pick that up. T we'll, we'll turn the camera off, then we'll pick it up, all right? I'll turn the camera off after you pick it okay, up. Okay, you turn the camera off now. You pick it up. Right, well, I've just been down the local wetland takeaway and caught myself a bit of local tucker. Fish. Wild water potatoes, topped off with a bit of salt from a local salinity site. Beautiful. You know, if I didn't know better, I'd say that was carp. <clears throat> yeah, this is a river, but this is a regulated river. You know, about 80% of the water you see going past me here now will end up being used for urban, industrial, or agricultural purposes. You know, it's a bit of a problem, but we're reliant on so many of these things in our society, but we use so much water to provide ourselves with all this food and comfort. Anyway, I can't sit around here talking. I've got a croc to catch. Turn the camera off, Justin. Well, here I am back at the floodplain wetland, and it seems incredible, but we've only just learned to value the role that wetlands play in the conservation of flora and fauna, like these penguins behind me. They are important sites for breeding, feeding, and drought refuge for an enormous number of species dependent on wetlands for their entire lifestyle. It's recognised that wetlands enhance water quality by filtering sediment, reusing nutrients, absorbing and releasing floodwaters back into the system, and as an important source of organic material that goes back into the river. Whew, could be a bit warmer though, a bit cool here. <laughs> Crocs like warmer water, you know. Anyway, I'm here as a human bait, trying to entice the croc out. Ooh, I think I might have something. Oh, it's a leech. Justin, it's a leech! It's a leech! I, it's a leech! It's a leech! Justin, it's a leech! In Australian dams, you've got two layers of water, warm and cold. 
The outflow at the base of the dam is generally very cold, low in oxygen, high in nutrients, things like phosphorus and ammonium. Now this is no good for your aquatic insects and fish that live downstream from the dam. Native fish, for instance, can't hope to spawn in that sort of cold stuff. One solution is to release warmer water from the top of the reservoir. Multi-level offtakes have been developed for this purpose. Another is to artificially mix all the water in the reservoir, thus dispersing the cold bottom layer. For this purpose, I'm going to be using the Rusty Gudgeon Action Mixing Drill. Mixing up all the water there. This could take some time. Of course, supplying water during the irrigation season often results in the river running at a constant height for long periods. Long periods of constant flow can change the shape of the river by causing bank erosion, which results in channel widening. But if you get a sudden change in the weather, like a thunderstorm, people downstream might need as much river water for their needs. So the river managers release less water from the reservoirs, the sudden drop in flow can lead to waterlogged banks collapsing, increasing turbidity. Turbidity, well, it's just another name for dirty water. Anyway, come up here to catch a croc. These chunks of granite are helping to stop erosion, and that's a good thing. The downside is that your local platypus will need a jackhammer to dig a hole through this lot. Crocs don't like it either. The granite scratches their guts. These willow branches make great crocodile traps. Here, I'm using a design taught to me by native hunters. Speaking of native, willows are not. Yet they're so prolific, people think they're our own. Like they should be on the coat of arms or something. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, Rusty. <laughs> but they've fed and come gone berserk. Willows choke waterways, stop other species from getting a start. They drop all their leaves at once, thus creating a huge rush of food. But for the rest of the year, the river starves whereas native trees provide a steady source of food year-round. But herein lies a problem. You can't just pull willows out and start again. The holes left would lead to massive erosion, and you can't rock bank the entire Murray or paint the banks with cement to hold them firm. Your local land care group can tell you the best way to attack your willow problem. I found myself pondering the complexity, the beauty, and also the sadness that the Upper Murray showed me. There's so much to learn, so much to understand, and in a lot of ways, so little time. But at the same time, I felt heartened by the work people were getting involved with, and how they were able to see the bigger picture. Concepts like catchment management are new to jokers like me, but for many, they are a personal philosophy, a way of life. It was in a moment of pure serenity that my mind was catapulted back to the reality of my own reality. There, not two metres on my left, but coming in at 22 feet and 220 kilos was the true reason for my journey. Big Reg, the killer croc. My physical being responded in the only way it knows. Like the river itself, I am a living legend who must do what it must do. Reg was no match for my virile manly cunning.
and I felt a bit ordinary returning him to his captivity. He's been a part of our landscape for the last 20 million years, just like the river. Who was I to bottle him up, just so I could make a documentary? It got me to thinking. If Reg wasn't in trouble, if the river wasn't in trouble, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> then I wouldn't have a job. Then I wouldn't be able to punce about in helicopters and stuff. Then suddenly, I got a call that slammed my reality back into reality. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. Been right there. Righto, Justin, couple of bilbies and the go and I've gone berserk just outside of Uluru. Let's hit the chopper. Oh, you said we'd get some skiing in while we were here. No way, mate. Come on, job's on, mate. Pack up. No way, you said skiing. I'm Justin, turn off the camera. Skiing. Turn off the camera. No way, your exact words were. Justin, turn off the camera and mount the chopper, please. I never told him what Wright Parian means. You told me we were going skiing. 